Is it worth getting a Switch at this time? Honestly, I think so. Uh, part of the issue is, of course, finding a Switch right now. It's not quite as bad as it was when we were in like mid-April and they were just not anywhere, but you still have to rely on a little bit of luck to find Switches in stock, especially at local retailers. But if you find one, Honestly, I think now is still a great time to buy one. The library is as strong as it's ever been. There's lots of great games to play. The only time I ever really tell people to hold off on buying a Switch is if there's a good chance a new one is coming out sometime soon. In fact, a video I made back in April of 2019, one of my most disliked videos ever made, was called Don't Buy the Switch Right Now. And to be fair, I was probably a little too overly negative in that video, which is why it got the response it did. But the main point I was trying to make at the time was, hey, there's lots of rumors that we're gonna get a Switch Lite sometime soon. We're gonna get maybe a Switch Pro, which didn't end up happening, but we did get the revised Switch basically five months later, which offered better battery life and less heat production, which were really good reasons to hold off on buying a Switch. Because if you bought one, say, in June and just three months later there's a new model out with more battery life at the same price, it's kind of a stinging feeling. Now as for right now, I don't think that's an issue. Uh, of course one of the big things a lot of people like to talk about is, hey maybe there's a Switch Pro coming out sometime soon, and I think a Switch Pro in 2021 is very possible but I don't think it's going to be something that's going to be necessarily early 2021. I think at the soonest that's going to be maybe a summer release, probably more likely something closer to the fall, and so at the soonest I think you could see a new Switch model in a year from now, more likely a year and a half, and that being the case, I don't think that's necessarily a big reason to hold off on buying a Switch right this moment. Now, if you already own another gaming system and there's only like one or two games in the Switch that are jumping out at you, then yeah, maybe you could end up holding off a little bit. But honestly, I think it's perfectly fine to buy one right now, and honestly, a good idea, because there are a lot of great titles to catch up on right now. What do you think Microsoft needs to do on their next event to one-up Sony? And a question I kind of want to just group into this one are, what are you most looking forward to in the July Xbox event? So as for what I'm looking most forward to, I really want to see what Obsidian has to show off. They are one of my favorite dev teams. I love a lot of their titles, whether it's Outer Worlds, Pillars of Eternity, some of the kind of spin-off games they did for other companies like Fallout New Vegas. So I'm really excited to see what their next game is. There is, of course, the multiplayer game they've been working on where you're playing as the Shrunken kids, and that's cool and all, but I'm really hoping to get some more news about their next RPG that they're working on, and I'm hoping that's what we see for the Xbox event. And this ties into what I think Xbox needs to do to one-up Sony. There's really two things I think they need to do before the system's release. I mean, next July would be great if they did them both at the same time, but the big two things I think they really need to hit up are exclusives and what exactly is going on with Project Lockhart. On the exclusive front, I think Microsoft has done a great job of advertising what is cool about the Xbox Series X. I think they've really emphasized the concept of it being a very powerful system. I think a lot of the stuff they've announced as far as things like smart delivery and tying in some of their services is very consumer friendly. But at the end of the day, the big thing that's gonna cost someone to say, oh, I like this system more than this system, is what games can I play on it? And that's where exclusives play a very important role. And right now, they don't have a lot. There's plenty of rumors about things they might be working on. We've heard of stuff like there might be a Fable game in the works. Uh, there was a recent thing on Twitter where people thought that we were getting confirmation of Perfect Dark and Fable and that ended up not being real, at least for the Perfect Dark side of things. The Fable one I think is a little more murky, but the main point is, is that they just really need to come up with some more titles that you can't find anywhere else aside from PC with how they handle things as a justification for why you should get their system versus a PS5 or even just sticking with a Switch. And I think there's a couple things they can rely on here. Obviously we have Halo Infinite. I think there's probably going to be a Forza game announced sometime before launch because let's face it, that's usually a yearly release for Xbox. And they picked up a ton of devs during the end of the Xbox One life cycle, so hopefully they've been really pouring resources into those companies to make some big hit exclusives just for them, whether it's reviving older franchises like Fable or releasing something that's new, unique, and different, which I'm hoping to see from some of these companies like Ninja Theory. The other thing that I think could potentially really one up Sony is getting a confirmation on what exactly Project Lockhart is and if it's coming out at launch side by side with Series X, because I think a big thing a lot of people 
people are focusing on right now is just the raw power of each system, which is great, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of people out there that honestly don't care. They just want a system that plays the newest games coming out and at least runs them at a nice, smooth frame rate. And for situations like that, a cheaper, more affordable system that doesn't hit 4K resolution is a very tempting offer. And so if we can actually get confirmation on what Lockhart is, what features it has and what features it doesn't have, and a price point for how it compares to not only the Series X, but the PS5 and the PS5 All Digital, I think a cheap enough option for that system could be a huge win for them. So if the July event can really heavily focus on not necessarily true exclusives because of how Microsoft handles things, but at least games that you can't play on a PlayStation and at the same time confirms a cheaper system option that's gonna be much more affordable for a lot of people out there, that's gonna be the biggest way I think for them to come back is making their system something that's not only more affordable, but show off some great games that you can't play anywhere else, at least not on Sony. Any plans on streaming games live in the future? I think it would be very cool to see your real-time reaction to games and see you make comments on the technical side of games as you play. This is something I've been wrestling with for a while. I keep telling myself I should really start streaming at some point, especially now that I've been spending a lot more time in my apartment. I even have most of the equipment that I need to do it. Uh, if I'm being perfectly honest with you guys, I kind of get weird anxiety issues with live streaming. I don't know why. There's a disconnect when I do stuff with videos because I can shoot it in my apartment by myself and then I upload it later as an edited video and you can see that. But when it's a live thing like streaming, I don't know, I just get like, my blood runs more and stuff. I will also say that I am very bad at multitasking. Uh, you're either gonna see me interact with the audience a lot and be very bad at the game I'm playing or I'll make a lot of progress in the game but then not talk to anyone and I'm just gonna have a dead stone face with a mouth slightly open and no one wants to actually watch that. That being said, I have been really toying with the notion of doing this sometime soon. Uh, if you're interested in seeing me stream, make sure you're following me on Twitter at Kevin Kenson because if I do start streaming, I'm gonna announce when and where there. In all likelihood, I'll probably just play some kind of really repeatable game I can have fun with like Hades and not something that I need to really pay super hard attention to. That way I can walk the balance of not playing really bad and still talk to you guys. What will Nintendo announce at the next Direct whenever it is? The next Nintendo Direct will be in 2022. After waiting two years of not having a single brand new Nintendo Direct, they will finally give us a new one where the only announcement is that they are pushing back Metroid Prime 4 just one more time. I really have no idea. I'm honestly not sure what's going on with the direct format right now because while it was a great way of lumping news together, news right now is something that's a bit more sporadic because Nintendo probably doesn't have the best idea of what's going on with all the dev teams they're working with. And so that's why we're seeing much more kind of solo announcements from different projects. For instance, I'm pretty sure that Paper Mario announcement was supposed to be part of a Nintendo Direct that ended up being canceled because they didn't really know what was going on with a lot of other releases at the same time. So with things being the way they are, in the world right now, I don't know if we're gonna get a new Direct anytime soon. We might not even get one for the rest of the year, but I think that doesn't necessarily mean we're not gonna see any new announcements. I think Nintendo's gonna rely a lot more on just these kind of solo releases here and there, just kind of emphasizing and highlighting a specific game one at a time, and honestly, I'm fine with that. Having a back-to-back -back hype segment like a Nintendo Direct is great, but it's not the only way you can handle announcing new information. And on a related note to that question, do you think Nintendo will release anything besides Paper Mario this year? Do you think they're waiting to announce some games for late 2020, or do you think they have nothing to reveal? I don't think it's fair to say that they have nothing planned for the end of the year. I think they had a lot of stuff planned going into 2020, and that promptly got off track because of COVID and other things. And so, I don't think they have nothing planned. I think they're just waiting to confirm stuff once they have a better idea that it will be able to hit target windows they originally had set. I think we definitely have some more games to look forward to later this year. What they are, I don't know for sure. I know a lot of people are hoping for Breath of the Wild 2, which I'm still very skeptical about, but considering the fact that Paper Mario got announced earlier this year and its release date is, you know, not even the fall time, I think it's pretty safe to assume that there are more games they're waiting to announce that could be coming out this year. Of course, I have my fingers crossed for a lot of Nintendo franchises that I hope they revive or bring back, or for instance, giving us actual hard release dates of games that we've just kind of heard about in the background for a while, like Metroid Prime 4 or Bayonetta 3. But honestly, I'm just willing to be patient, wait to see what they announce, and let the surprises come if they do have any in store. Because while I don't know what it's going to be, I feel pretty confident in saying that they at least are going to have something 
for fall of 2020. Most used Nintendo Switch accessory. There are a few things that I kind of switch between and use really often, but if there's any accessory I go back to a lot, it's having a grip for my Switch. In particular, I like using the Satisfy one, either for the regular full-size Switch or the Switch Lite. Like I've said many times before, I use the Switch as a handheld system. It's great if you enjoy doing stuff in docked mode, but personally, I just play a lot in handheld. Even right now, when I'm staying home and not going out a lot, I still just kind of play it in my handheld laying on the couch rather than on the TV. And so I want to use an accessory that makes it a lot more comfortable, which the Satisfy Grip does. There's a lot of other stuff that I could recommend. Uh, of course, there are controllers like using for docked mode, but if there's the single most used accessory for me, it's definitely a grip. Top three gaming franchises of all time. Okay, so. The usual disclaimer I give with any kind of top ranking I do like this is that I change my mind a lot. There's probably one franchise in here that's gonna be a safe lock-in, but depending on when you ask me this question, I will probably give you different answers. That being said, right now, top three gaming franchises. Uh, number one, Final Fantasy. It's just always been a huge part of my gaming experience. I have played the vast majority of games in that franchise. I grew up playing them. I still play the new ones coming out these days. While it has been a little more hit and miss for me in recent years, Final Fantasy VII Remake was still great, and I love so much of what they put out in the late 90s to mid-2000s that that's just always going to be a safe franchise for me to lock in. Second series, Elder Scrolls. Uh, it's a smaller franchise compared to things like Final Fantasy, but what individual titles they have out have been huge hits. I haven't actually played every single game inside the franchise, especially some of the really older ones, but I have put so much time into Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind, 4 Oblivion, and 5 Skyrim that, yeah, that's a big franchise for me. I'm really looking forward to the day that we could actually see some kind of Elder Scrolls 6 news, even though I'm a little worried at this rate what it's going to turn into, but still, I love those games so much, I am very excited for anything else they put out. And lastly, a franchise that is basically complete at this point. I mean, I guess Konami could try to do something with it, but Still, I'd rather they just leave it alone. Metal Gear Solid. I absolutely love pretty much all the mainline Metal Gear Solid games. There's definitely a hierarchy of what I like more and like less, but overall it is a fantastic franchise. There are a lot of things that was just done super well in it, not only in terms of storytelling, but gameplay. It's just, yeah. Metal Gear Solid is among one of the best franchises, and I think it would be best at this point for Konami to just leave it be and let it be what it is in history. Say you wanted to play an early PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo game that wasn't remastered or put on Virtual Console. What's your preferred way of doing that? Stuff like original system versus emulation on PC and CRT versus upscaler. What equipment do you use for that? Okay, so there are a lot of ways you can go about doing this. Uh, when I was younger, I definitely dipped my toes in emulation a lot more because it was free. Uh, not necessarily entirely legal, but it was just, you know, I was a younger kid in high school, college. I wasn't exactly gonna spend money on a ton of other ways to find rare games. Nowadays, when I play stuff, I like walking a balance of actually using some old school retro stuff, but then also having the convenience of playing on a modern TV. So upscalers are really one of the main ways that happens, especially specialized ones. Like for instance, with the GameCube, I really like using the GCHD, uh, but even more so for some of the older systems like the NES, SNES, and Sega Genesis, I really love Analog's products. They are not the cheapest way to play old games, but they do such a beautiful job of making them playable on a modern system and still let you do things like play with original controllers. If you're not familiar with them, they've made systems like the NT and Super NT and the SG, which are all just really nice looking systems that you can put actual old carts into and play the games on modern TV and it looks absolutely beautiful. And in fact, they have one more product on the way right now, which is a Game Boy design focused on playing everything from the Game Boy library. I am very much looking forward to that. Those are definitely my favorite ways to play old games, assuming that, you know, that system has that one. Uh, I will say specifically for Xbox, I really just rely on my Xbox One at this point. Backwards compatibility supports all the games I really care about. Every now and then there'll be a random game that I have the itch for that I realize isn't supported by backwards compatibility. In that case, I just break out the actual old system. I still have them. But for the most part, I just rely on backwards compatibility for that, which is really nice. With non-exclusive games, how do you decide which console to play them on? It's kind of a knee-jerk reaction for me, to be honest. I just kind of make it depending on the game when I see it. Uh, one kind of general rule I do follow is that if it is a major franchise, if I can trace its roots back to a certain system, I tend to play it on the modern version of that system. So for instance, let's say Resident Evil, I'm more than likely gonna play that on PlayStation. That being said, one thing that I have found myself doing a lot lately is if it's any kind of Japanese RPG or really even anything made by a Japanese company, I tend to grab it on PlayStation. 
PlayStation, especially if it's something that I want a physical copy of, I go that direction. As for more Western titles, especially big AAA stuff, I like doing that on the Xbox One X because I'm not as compelled to buy those physically. It's just not something I'm adding to my collection all the time. And the One X is the more powerful of the two systems as far as just raw performance. So a lot of times I end up falling that way for big AAA stuff like say Assassin's Creed. Which upcoming games are you excited for? Uh, I'm gonna do this in two different tiers, a big game and a smaller game. Big game, Cyberpunk 2077. If you couldn't tell from my favorite franchises I was talking about earlier, I am a big fan of RPGs, and so I'm very much looking forward to what they're doing with this game. I love first person view, kind of choose your own adventure type stuff and building your character, so all things I very much love and I'm looking forward to in Cyberpunk. Uh, on a smaller scale, and something that's actually coming out uh, really soon and was just recently announced, Curse of the Moon 2. I loved the original Curse of the Moon. This was a spin-off game of Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, where, you know, Ritual of the Night is meant to be a sort of, here's a game that plays like Metroidvanias, whereas Curse of the Moon plays more like old school Castlevania, specifically Castlevania 3, where you had a party of characters. And Curse of the Moon did just such an amazing job of feeling like a retro game, but not letting itself be chained by some of the kind of downsides of that time. It was still difficult, but not frustratingly so. And so I'm really excited to see what they do with a new title that's not only adding a new cast of characters, but still letting you play as the old characters and is adding co-op options. It's just, there's a lot there that I'm very excited for. If you did not play the original Curse of the Moon, I highly recommend checking it out. It is not an expensive game. It's on a lot of different platforms. Give it a shot. And if you enjoy it, get ready because Curse of the Moon 2 is out July 10th. It's gonna be awesome.